Okay. Oh, Jillian. Hi, Jillian. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. hi. Um, uh, should I start? Uh, hold on. Oh, okay. We're very professional. Okay. Um, welcome to Virtual Friday's Dire Literary Series. My name is Timothy Gager, and my guest tonight, who is making her third Dire Literary Series appearance, two of them live before the pandemic, and here's the third one as a Zoom reading, um, Marguerite Bouvard. And let me let me tell you a little bit about Marguerite. Um, and uh, I'll do this by sharing the screen if I can. There it is. So Marguerite is the author of ten poetry books and two of them have won awards, including the Mass Book Award for Poetry. She's also written many nonfiction books on women's rights, social justice, grief, illness, and the invisible wounds of war coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan. She's a former professor of political science and poetry, a former resident scholar at Women's Studies Research Center and Environmental Studies at Brandeis University. So with that, I am going to turn it over Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to show this um, book. I uh, this is a, I self published this book. I've been um, it's called Soul Songs by Dorsey Taylor, and it's on Amazon. Yeah, I've been writing to a black um, prisoner in Nebraska for a couple of years, and he's such a gifted man. I decided to publish his work. So if anyone's interested, it's on Amazon, and I also have a new book out which is the cosmos of the heart that I'll be reading from. So stop me if it, I go over 10 minutes. Uh, the first poem is called Power and it's for Colin Kaepernick. And I, I assume you all know who he is. It's, um, does anyone not know about Colin Kaepernick? Okay, great. Um, power, one, we walk into a protected natural reserve for native Hawaiians, a narrow path between trees and boulders with the sound of the distant surf, then come upon a blonde woman in an electric cart. When she sees the surprise on my face, she says, we own this and the ranch up the mountain. Two, there is a marriage, mirror where only one image flickers with its own colors and shades. And there is only one language, only one way to honor the creator. Three, the football player kneels during the national anthem, kneeling to honor his soul, to honor social justice and the color of his skin that too many disdain. And here's one that I think Tim would like. It's called The Magician. We are surrounded by a cold fog, not just in the mountains, but in our country where the facts are turned upside down, where ordinary citizens become scapegoats. And a woman in a restaurant screams at a woman on another table for wearing a headscarf. The fog obliterates our vision, shelters anger, and the man who waves his wand everywhere like a magician pulling tricks out of his hat and the crowd that applauds for he will provide jobs for everyone, make our country strong, provide security and bypass institutions the crowds believe no longer serve us while the political parties disagree among and within themselves. Like Weimar, the crowds believe the magician will push aside the elite and solve all of their problems. And here's one of them. I, I assume you know what ICE is, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And it's called Danny Rodriguez. Seven o'clock, the light is getting dim. You are waiting for the door to open, to hear your daddy's voice, asking you how your day went, to feel his arms holding you. He will read you the stories you hear at bedtime 
every night. But this time, after he came in, another door opened. A man entered who was an ICE official, was an angry face whom you have never seen before. He grabbed your father and dragged him away. You cannot sleep. And when you do, you scream. You have no words. So you just throw your breakfast on the floor and pull your hair. You have no answers. The door doesn't open when the light dims. Though you listen, your home is strange. When the light dims, you are so afraid. You have no words. The air is empty. Do you know how many thousands of kids have been separated from their parents? Hundreds of thousands. Well, um, the next poem is called Both Can Live Together. Heavy clouds create an opening for sunshine. The twittering birds fill the air. But in Hong Kong, the heavy crowds, two million are but a moment. Their voices stilled by one person. The person who holds the reins of prison, silence, torture, and acquiescence. But they can't eliminate history. Voices that were flags, memories that time cannot obliterate. Tiananmen Square, the tank man, the umbrella movement. Beneath layers of lies, truth is a tree that towers above barbed wire. Um, in a world of uh, perspectives, in a world of vast cumulus clouds, warming seas, filled with the sting of jellyfish, in a world of deeper stings, when a policeman shoots an innocent black man and then claims he was just protecting himself, where we do not see ourselves in the other and are blinded by hatred and a twisted version of history, there is another world a drawing of flowers made by a four-year-old child, the hand reaching out to another, the scent of a hidden garden, the spurt of bushes growing out of ancient volcanic rock, green feathers growing out of destruction, nature talking back to us, love sliding through the crevices. And, um, Um, my husband, my husband is French and we have a little place in the mountains in France where we go and see his family and then my family in Northern Italy where we can't go. And I've been watching it being overbuilt just like everything else. There was once a sea of green in the mountains, its tall blades undulating in the wind with its seeds glittering in waves purple, yellow, dark, and light. Blue flowers glisten, and the sea is not contained, but rises through the asphalt on its own trajectory. A journey whose sounds are not crashing waves, but crickets, clanging bells, hidden streams. There were once farmers whose blood pulsed with these sounds, the tides of fallow and fullness. It was a world in which we were one with the earth that we worshiped and tended its many gifts. Um, and speaking of climate change, um, when we were uh, in, in Comlut last year in France and it was hot one day, the next day we had um, an incredible cyclone that felled, I don't know, a whole meadow of trees and trees, one tree fell on my husband's car. It was pretty awful. 
but we don't have climate change, right? The importance of flowers. After the cyclone, rows of felled trees lie in front of the apartment building, and then there are the stumps that leave a message of destruction. But the caretaker of the buildings has placed a pot of magnificent flowers on each stump, each one with its own bloom and color, giving another message, one written by the famous Buddhist Thich Nhat Hanh. One flower is made of the whole universe. And I, I don't know, maybe I'll just read one more and then I have questions because I don't know what 10 minutes is. And um, um, the last one is called The Gift. Forget the wires stretching between ski lifts, another world that is now silenced with only the twittering of birds, their quiet music. What reigns here are stately evergreens, birches and ash, the scattering of wildflowers that are white caps on the river of glass with clouds, sky and meadow intertwined. They are not silent, but murmuring inside us, a present presence that was here before us with no doors, only windows into our hearts, minds, and souls where time and timelessness coexist. So that must be 10 minutes, is it? Was that 10 minutes? Yes, it is. Thank you so much, Marguerite. That was a wonderful reading and uh, your poetry. That's all from your new book. So, uh, well, can I just say one thing? And that yes, is, it's on Amazon for 15, but if you want to buy it from me, you can get it for 10. That's awesome. It just came out. Okay. So how do people um, find you to buy it from you? They call me on the phone or they email me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That makes sense. So I'm I have some questions for you. Um, so uh, you're a very strong advocate for women's rights and social justice. And as you know, the 60s was really, really known for those things. So after 50 years, why don't we seem to be making a whole lot of progress in that? Because right now we're moving backwards because um, our current administration has brought out supporting white supremacy. And because racism is um, institutionalized, where they live, where they work, uh, how they're paid, their health care. They live near, um, uh, black people live near places that are um, highly polluted and that makes them more um, vulnerable to uh, the coronavirus. And um, I'm sorry to say that our president brought it out. Um, so we're against Hispanics and um, I, you know, it's, it's pretty ugly right now. Pretty ugly. So do you think we can make a lot of progress in the next four years? Um, I'm, I, I think so. Not a lot because um, the administration has made a nice scorched earth policy so that it's going to be pretty hard to roll things back, both with the EPA and other things. But um, I think there's some hope in um, having a, a president that knows what democracy is. Now, do you feel there are other countries that are doing it better? And maybe you can note some of them. Um, <laughs> well, you know, in Western Europe, people pay very high taxes. And if you want to get elected in the States, you lower taxes. So you get universal health care in France. And I get my medications in France because they're a tenth of the price. And even though I'm not supposed to bring them in, I do it anyway. Um, so there is a social safety network for people in Western Europe. So people don't get evicted. I'm thinking of the coronavirus. People don't, um, don't go hungry. There's a whole social program that has been there for years. And that's, you know, very different from ours. So John Stickney has asked that political science and political, sorry, science and poetry 
and I'm going to add nonfiction to this group. They all seem to be on different paths. How do they cross? And uh, do you are you able to separate your poetry brain from your nonfiction brain? Mm -hmm. I'm a right left brain person, and that's where they go. But the thing is that that's why I'm not noted. Is I I keep writing in a different um, different subject every time. I've written a book on veterans. I've written a book on living with illness. I've written a book on grief. I've written. I just go in all different directions. And um, that's, I, I just can't help it because I have so many interests, I just. So when you're writing those various books, do you lock into that book or do you do like side projects while you're working on the main book? <laughs> side projects? <laughs> For example, so, so say you're working on your uh, grief and illness book. Uh, are you able to, rip off 10 poems between the no. beginning of that book and the end of that book. No, no, it's a subconscious. So it just happens sometimes. One happened when I was wide awake at night, the last one, and I had, I had the idea for it. And then I ran down and uh, did it. But no, they're, they're very separate. They're very separate. And um, I love um, volunteering. I do a lot of volunteering and that really, um, it keeps bringing me to new places, what I do and, and new discoveries. And I think you learn all your life. You don't stop learning. You learn important things like getting along with different people, et cetera. Now with your poems or your other work, do you ever find, actually I'm gonna concentrate on your poems for this question. Um, do you ever find that like you get writer's block around social issues, like either the issue is too strong or Heaven forbid, there are no real strong social issue triggers going on. Oh, I don't have a problem with social issues. I, that They fascinate me. In fact, I wrote a long poem about Trump that was published on writing in a woman's voice. I didn't want to read it tonight and I won't put it in the book. It's called The Man on Top. No, I have no problem with that. It just that it intertwines. It's part of me. You know, I, I think of that we're one family humanity and we have to treat each other as one family instead of being horrible to each other. Someone wants to know, they thought they heard the influence of Buddha in your nature poetry. Is that, yeah. is that a good call? Yeah, it is, it is. I, I, I love uh, every single religion and um, I'm not um, stuck on any one of them because we fight so much between religions it's pretty awful and people forget that jesus was jewish this i'm just going to say that just so that they think about it um being born in italy are there any italian poets have influenced your work um not really it's um it's uh, the landscape when i get to I, I feel like a plant that's found its roots when i get back to i'm born in trieste which is on the adriatic and it's gorgeous there and it's also it's a border town and so there are a lot of Slovenes there are a lot of different languages um, um, so it's it's the landscape and it's the people and everything like that inspires me and I remember years ago when um, there was still a communist system in Slovenia I couldn't you know it's a mile walk into Slovenia uh, there were border guards rifles, everything. And now you just walk in and that's something that's really inspired me to write too, so. All right, um, I'm gonna, before I jump back into politics, um, <laughs> do you find more satisfaction when you finish a poetry book or a nonfiction book? Is there a different emotional charge from you? Bet. Poetry, that's more important. And speaking of that, like, you know, the, you first, you open your reading by holding up a book by someone that's incarcerated in Nebraska. Now, how does that happen? How do you meet somebody? And then how do you find out that they're a poet? Like, what, what is that? Was that something that was assigned? Like you were oh. going to be a mentor? Or? No, there's an organization called Crossover Prison Ministries that contacted me when I was at Brandeis and said that Dorsey Taylor wanted to connect with me. I don't know how he found out about me. So we started writing to each other and I discovered all kinds of things about him that he was diabetic, he had um, 
he had health problems. And, but then um, I, I learned so much about how they're treated. Now, when this book came out and I sent him some, he, they said he could only keep one copy and they took the rest away. I sent him books, they sent them back. I keep sending him books, he's getting them now. But um, I, I found he, he's super smart. He learned Italian. So in our letters, sometimes I call him uh, amico mio and uh, sta bene and lots of things I write, he understands. And he's a man that knows about every different religion and supports it. And he started sending me things that he was writing and I was so impressed. Now he grew up in a ghetto, so his language is different. He says da instead of the, so what? But his, his writing is really lovely. And at the end of the book, he writes um, um, a short essay about what it was like growing up and it's horrific. If we grew up in a place like that, what would happen to us? We'd get shot. Uh, did he write before he went to prison or? Uh, I don't know. I don't, there's certain things I can't ask him. I'm in touch with his family, his sister, his son and his daughter. I telephone them and um, yep, we're just, um, oh, okay. <laughs> All right, um, I'm reading a question really quick. Uh, this is from, uh, Milande, she says, your life is a true gift to others. So your writings and everything you do, is there something or someone that has shaped your understanding of the world to be the person you are today? It's a great question. Oh, she's a lovely woman. I, I spent two years uh, teaching for free at, at um, Archipel University in Haiti. She founded the university and she does everything she can for Haiti. She's a wonderful singer. She's a she organizes things to help Haiti. So, um, um. so, so let me uh, let me uh, end up here on this last question. So you've done a lot of traveling and a lot of teaching, which obviously goes back and it influence influences your work and your writing. Uh, what do you feel? What location have you made as a writer the most connection with? I don't connect very well ex because I have eight chronic illnesses. So what do you mean by connection? For example, like uh, um, a, a location that you love so much that it shows in your writing, that it stimulates oh. your writing. Oh, that one is Combleu where we have a small apartment and it, you can see the Mont Blanc, the mountains from there and the clouds, it's beautiful. And the other one is uh, Trieste, where I go to visit my family, which, I, as I said, it's on the Adriatic. It's just beautiful. It's in the Lombardy region, which is <laughs> loaded with coronavirus right now. But it's what it, I'm a very visual person, and that's what inspires me. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much for your wonderful reading and uh, your, your Q&A. And uh, let's... Uh, Let's uh, look at some of your books. And uh, even though this is, the, I always encourage people to shop at indie bookstores because of, uh, to keep them going. And Mar Margarita kindly says you can save some money by dealing directly with her and her books. But here is some of her books. And um, are we missing any of them? Uh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> that's what they're going to put on my gravestone out of print. <laughs> A lot of them. One of them, I did a big book on social justice um, with a big uh, publishing company and it's out of print. They sold it all. So um, my favorite book is the one revolutionizing motherhood. Um, I was in Argentina at a very dangerous time. My husband begged me not to go, but I went anyway. And uh, I called everyone, my um, Congresswoman, this person, that person, they said, don't go. I went and it was the most amazing experience because I, I, was in, I was afraid, terrified because I was followed by the security guards all the time. But I learned a lot. The women I wrote about, that they were standing up to the junta. Some of them hadn't passed sixth grade because they were poor. They were phenomenal. 
and I, it was a learning experience. Um, it, and I learned about anger and there's two different kinds of anger. One is anger at injustice and one is anger that brings forth hatred because you're upset about things. I guess I missed one question. So the last one, many, many Americans are willing and even enthusiastic to vote for a would be dictator. As writers, what can we do and do we even stand a chance? Uh, I, you know what I worry about? People don't read newspapers. They read, they go on Facebook, they go here, they go, they don't think. And I have noticed that every year I taught, I used to give a book a week, then it was a chapter a week, then you know, then I had to show them a movie. And then, I, um, you know, it, people are, um, our education has fallen. People don't read, they don't, they only, well, I had, when we moved here, it was a tiny little, a very ordinary suburb. And now I'm surrounded by millionaires. All they think about are themselves. And there's been an exacerbation between poor and rich that's enormous. People are hungry and uh, homeless. And um, that worries me a lot. That worries me a lot. All right, Marguerite, my thanks to you once more. For Thank the people you. watching on Facebook, we're going to shut off that stream in a few minutes. But our last, just for you guys, our last um, feature of the year before the holidays will be Pam, Pam, uh, Pam Painter next week. So uh, please feel free to come and check that out. And we'll stop the live screen, stream. So see you guys later.